All right, good evening. Welcome everybody to the Berwick Planning Board. This is a regular meeting for Thursday, January 7th, 2021. If we can all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge, Pledge of Allegiance, Allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Planning Board members present tonight. We have the Vice Chair, Nicole Fecto. We have regular member, David Ross Lyons. Also on our Zoom, we have regular member, Michael LaRue and alternate, Jerry Graybill. So uh, with the absence of a regular member who has left the board, uh, Jerry, you'll be voting tonight, okay? Also, we have our town um, code enforcement officer, Jennifer, on Zoom. And then we have here in the audience, we have our town planner, James. And we have the um, applicant here for this application. Is there anybody in a waiting room waiting to get on for uh, public comment? Nope. Okay. So there's no members of the public here, so we won't have any public comment session. Uh, next on the agenda is the approval of minutes for the December 3rd, 2020 meeting. So we've got four people who were present for that meeting at this meeting tonight. No, you don't. Do you? Oh, Jerry was there. Yeah. Yeah, Jerry. I missed that. Got two. We have a motion from David to accept the minutes. We have a second. I'll second. Seconded by Michael and further discussion. Okay, Nicole? Stain. David? Yes. Mike? Yes. Jerry? Yes. And I vote yes. So that is uh, one, two, three, four. All right. Next on the agenda is new business, sketch plan, site plan review, 20 Sullivan Street. The applicant, or this is the uh, VC and FBI zone in the village overlay district, and the applicant is Great Falls Construction. I'll turn it over to the town planner. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's a long time in the making. Um, this is a sketch plan for a site plan. Um, given the scope and scale of this project, um, the Great Falls construction and thought it was appropriate to check in at a conceptual level. Uh, the edge is the former prime tanning site. It's 7.9 acres and it's in the village commercial district. It's also subject to the village overlay district. So the village overlay district is part of a hybrid form based code it has form requirements and it's also subject to zoning as well. The following are the core objectives for the village overlay district. It will improve and expand Berwick's downtown and provide connections to open space and adjacent, adjacent residential neighborhoods. It will allow for repurposing of former industrial buildings and new buildings for commercial and residential uses, allowing for a core downtown area of higher density mixed use, including low impact manufacturing, offices, retail, and other commercial businesses and multifamily housing. There's a continuous open space known as a greenway will run through the former tannery site connecting recreational areas to the downtown neighborhoods to the community open space near now the existing fire station the village overlay will have a tight network of streets including a new main street with wide sidewalks street trees and buildings set close to the street or with front ends on pleasing outdoor public spaces and a greenway connects public open spaces to the downtown and to adjacent neighborhoods and there's a, a wide range of residential buildings. So that's an overview. And now for some of the details um, from a, a vote that failed Tuesday, we had a, a litany of ordinance changes that we were looking for. And um, I can speak to some of the issues now for the site plan and, and conformance issues. The first thing is, is parking. Um, and a couple waivers would be required, which are embedded in our village overlay district 6.4.4.1 the planning board may waive or adjust all requirements for parking within the village overlay district when it is not possible or it is in the best interest of the town to meet the requirements so that would speak to the max parking lot size 
but also also embedded in um, 6.4 is a reference to 7.7, .7, which speaks to requirements for uh, residential units. And it just, um, I'll let um, Craig speak later on about how um, it just really wouldn't be possible to have a max of 30 parking spaces and meet section 7.7. .7. Also, it's um, a waiver would be required um, and permissible to allow angle parking on Main Street. Um, other issues, there's a max uh, building footprint for building number five. Can you just go back and explain to people who might be watching at home Absolutely. the current parking requirements and why they are requesting a, per, uh, a, a waiver? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a max uh, parking space requirement, and that was done because... Um, through some of the site plans we had seen, uh, there was very large parking areas in the middle of the downtown. And the purpose of the max area is to keep the site walkable, presentable. And then for the whole purpose of having parallel mandated on Main Street, that actually was something I advocated for uh, back when we had a about an eight month run where the planning board in Vision Berwick, we met once or twice a week to nail down this village overlay section. Uh, the whole purpose of having parking along, parallel parking along Main Street is to keep the street more narrow, but there's also a trade-off um, where they're proposing multiple storefronts along Main Street to have angle parking uh, in front of those buildings, it will help the viability of those offerings and just make them more valuable. So to speak to the crossings and keeping it pedestrian crossing, you'll see that they have uh, a few crosswalks where they have bump outs. So they, they do keep that campus feel of being able to cross Main Street and keep it walkable. So that's, that's, that's parking. And so the other piece is the max footprint. Um, 5.2.C.5 allows a provision for replacement of a structure by building a new structure. And they can build in a way so if it's located on the lot, so the nonconformity is improved. So by building a 30,000 square foot building, they're replacing a 40,000 square foot building and therefore increasing the conformity. On uh, building three, four, and seven, I'll, if it's okay with you, Dave, to defer to Craig to speak to those issues and kind of the conversations we've had to meet confirm conformity. Okay, thanks, James. I'll yep. turn it over to you. If you could just state your name and business and that you're representing the applicant. Sure. Good evening, my name is Craig Burgess. I am with Sebago Technics. We are based out of South Portland, Maine. I'm a project manager there. We have staff of about 70 and we have a, many different service areas. And on this project, we'll be providing the civil engineering, the surveying, the landscape architecture, and the traffic engineering. Tonight, I'm representing Great Falls. John Smith is here with me tonight. And Cynthia Smith is also on the on the, on the uh, Zoom call tonight as well. Um, and Julie, sorry. So I have a little bit of a presentation, but I'm not gonna bore everyone tonight with all the details. I'm sure that everyone in the town and the planning board has been very involved on the site. It's a very prominent site in Berwick and Great Falls and Sebago Technics, we understand just how important this project really is. And we're invested in making this a very great project for the town of Berwick. My presentation has some highlights of the site. You know, this was originally developed, I think, back in the 1800s. But more recently, in the 1930s, it was developed as a tannery site, which shut down in 2008. It is now a brownfield site. And over the past, over the years since 2008, it has gone through the efforts to clean up the site. And um, I know that the planning board has been involved and there's been just a, a, a lot of discussions around this site to get it to the point where it is today. And today it is, uh, it, it 
currently out there is three buildings and a cap. And that moving forward with this project, we're just gonna have to be very careful around the brownfield standards and the VRAP standards associated with that cleanup effort. And there'll be some coordination back and forth with Maine DEP on that. As James mentioned, the site is approximately eight acres. It is with, within the village overlay district standards. And there are many, many standards that are almost specific to this site that we have gone through and started to develop a site plan that almost goes through each one of those standards and, and, and addresses it in a way that's gonna make this a really nice project. Around 10 one to three story mixed use residential and commercial buildings are proposed at this time. Four new curb cuts serving two new roadways, a main road roadway connecting Sullivan and school streets. The project will propose creation of green spaces, sidewalks, plaza areas for the public to use. And it will involve the teardown and demolition of the two buildings to the north over here. And the L-shaped building to the southeast will be renovated as part of this project. Earlier this year, Sebago completed a, an existing condition survey of this site. At the onset of Sebago Technics in, involvement here, we received a lot of different, a, a lot of data on the site, which had a lot of different plans. We took the time to go through all those plans and really soak in all of the information that there was. Sebago Technics referenced those plans and, and going out and, and conducting this survey. And so what you're looking at here is the survey that we submitted as part of the sketch plan application. These are the, the, the two buildings to the north which will be demolished as part of this project. Great Falls looked at possibly saving these buildings. And as everyone's aware, the buildings out there on the site today are antiquated and need of a lot of work. So at this time, Great Falls feels that it's best and, and it really won't fit well with this project. So those two buildings are being uh, demolished as part of this project. The, pro the building to the south, this L-shaped building will be protected and renovated. In my presentation, I have a several photos that just show what these buildings look like from a, from a higher level. And you can just see how, how they are in need of, of so much attention and they're falling apart. And if you look at this building right here, you can just get a really good understanding just how much work it would take to try to save these buildings. Even the building that's being renovated, you can see how the north side of that building is just completely open to the elements. Gray Falls looked at this building and actually the frame of it is actually in fairly good shape. So this building will be renovated as part of this project. We do know that and we understand that there is such a rich history here at this site. And so we're trying to do our best effort to preserve some part of the site that's out there today. We also recognize that there's a memorial site to the south and if you had a chance to review the sketch plan, you'll see that that general area of the site will be maintained as like a green space and that memorial will be rebuilt to honor the site's rich history. So over the last year, Sebago has worked with Great Falls to develop this site layout. We went through many different iterations and looked at some of the past concepts that have been developed as part of the, the VRAP cleanups uh, process. And this sketch plan is, is what Great Falls envisions as the best use of this property. It's bringing in 10 new buildings. And as I mentioned, that existing L-shaped building will be completely renovated. Two, uh, two new curb cuts will serve what we're calling the new Main Street. One curb cut is on School Street and the other is on Sullivan Street. And this is the main arterial serving this site. There's another access road which will have a curb cut on Wilson Street over in this area. And then lastly, a fourth curb cut, another one on School Street serving a drive-through area 
and a another building and a parking area. And as James alluded to, we're gonna be needing a waiver for this angled parking that you see along Main Street here. This plan, at, as it's shown now, is very preliminary in nature still. We totally anticipate going back and revisiting some of the sites and adding a lot more detail as we move forward into the site plan approval process. But really, and we really appreciate you allowing us to come here today at this level. We understand that it's not part of the process, but this project is just so significant. There's a lot of moving parts here. And before we really dive into the design, we really want to get your feedback on what you see are some other potential issues, what you like, what you don't like. This is the parking area here. This is, this is the largest parking area that's currently proposed. I believe there's around 60 parking spaces or so just in this parking lot alone. There's another one over here closer to School Street, which will be 40 parking spaces. The current standards require um, 1.5 to two parking spaces per per residential unit, depending on the number of bedrooms. Within this overlay zone, there are no parking requirements actually for commercial space. But I think we all understand that that's not technically reasonable if you want, if you want patrons to go to these commercial spaces. So there needs to be some allowance for, for parking for the commercial on site, but also residential, which we would hope that the residential is a little bit more separated from the commercial parking, which would really be along the access drive and then the main street. So to really get those numbers to work, we have to find parking on this site. And at this time, we don't know how many residential units are proposed. We're still, Great Falls is still working through that. We don't know what the total square footage of commercial space and residential space is. We'll, we'll know that for our next submission going forward, but we'd like to get a little bit of feedback from you tonight on how you see parking, because really we wanna, we wanna be able to make the parking work on this site. We also understand that there are some concept plans out there for some additional striping on Sullivan and school for additional parallel parking spaces. We don't show that on this plan now, and I would hope that we can start to integrate some of those concept plans into the next iteration of this site plan. So there is this parking issue that we have to talk about tonight. And we would be asking for a waiver just to try to build in as much parking for residential. It's really the residential that I think that we need to find parking for because that's the biggest need for parking. Other things like the, the walkway widths, crosswalks, we can work through those details to make it work. There are a couple other issues that James brought up, including building size. So Great Falls will look closer into some of the larger buildings. There's three large buildings that exceed that 15,000 square foot minimum footprint. It's building five, building three, and building four. So I would like to have a discussion around that tonight, but I think that we'll probably have to go back and, and, and look to see if there are opportunities to kind of break that into a smaller footprints unless the board sees a path forward that where we can keep the general footprints as depicted on this plan. Uh, these footprints just generally represent the most um, efficient way to use this space, both for commercial and residential. The um, egress onto School Street, right now we're still evaluating this and we understand that this overlay district also requires buildings to be a minimum distance from the property line. And you can probably see here that this, the coffee shop that we're showing just doesn't meet that. So we're exploring different opportunities to try to make that standard work so that um, that isn't a standard that doesn't meet the ordinance, but we would also like to get your feedback tonight on your thoughts on that because we explored many different ways to have a drive through at this area. I think we all recognize that School Street is, is the most busy street. 
So the frontage along School Street is very important to Great Falls, very important to the tenants that will be here. So having a coffee shop and a bank, those, those are anchor tenants. So we really want to try to make this work for Great Falls, for the tenants. And having a coffee shop here, it, it gets a lot of people into the site. It gets a lot of people using the commercial space. It will be an anchor tenant for them. Um, you can see that this area of the site is fairly limited. It's, it's in a area of the site, which is it's starting to get a little bit restricted just due to, to space and trying to save this existing building. So we're, we're, we're really trying to shoehorn this in that, to create a design that actually works. There is a little bit more of a coordination effort that is necessary with Maine DOT, and we have scheduled the pre-application meeting with them to discuss this project, the, the curb cuts that are proposed, as well as this drive-through, and potentially evaluating the opportunity to have two exits onto School Street for the drive-through if this building orientation does not work for the board. Here's a picture of where that frontage is along School Street. So you can see that this site will really dress this area up pretty good. Um, it's across the street from the fire station. There is the town's pump station here. And it would be nice if as part of this project that in working with the town, we can come up with a way to um, add some more screening at this pump station because it's going to be right there at the project and this project is we really want to make it look nice so it'd be nice if we can integrate some new landscape in our screen and at that pump station as part of the sketch plan application we also submitted a lot of different architectural renderings uh, provided by ryan senator architecture and it gives you an idea of what the massing looks like And I believe Ryan may be on tonight if there are any architectural related questions. But you can, you can see how, what this site may look like. Again, this is very conceptual in nature. Um, as part of the next step moving forward, we will submit elevation views, floor plans, and the detailing of all the different facades. So you can see how this site really kind of creates that, that downtown feeling that Great Falls wants to create here, especially along this main street with between these two buildings, these two larger buildings right here. So you, I, I, we understand that there's a 15,000 square foot minimum footprint, but you can see how these larger footprints would work here. There are some interesting features proposed as part of this, project, including um, potentially a bridge at the entry right across here from Town Hall. This bridge would provide connectivity between these two buildings here and also just kind of really set the tone as, as people enter the site. Can I just ask you to go to the north or to the, to the, to the right? Yeah. That. Is that building depicted on the plans? I thought there was a parking lot there. This, this, this area right here, yeah. I'll no, the no, go down right there. That that big on the bottom, that one right there. Yeah, yeah. that would be building, building five. Five. Look, five. Yeah, it doesn't look like it looks like maybe underneath the building is parking. Well, building five is just this looks like an I-shaped building. Let me go back to that and we can yeah. compare. It. That's like the but first I'm seeing on that rendering yeah. is it looked like it, there was no parking lot there. Yeah. It looks like there's. It looks like the parking is maybe under the building like it's the the building is starts at level two yeah the parking to, would be underneath that first level so see how the parking lots are kind of a light gray and the buildings are a different color if the if the parking is under the building oh so this whole thing is a building correct i got you yeah and the parking is under it same thing okay with, same Perfect. thing with over here building number four which is kind of like an l-shaped under or the first floor, right. Right. So first, so, yeah. Like one of them. See that around, rendering because like, I thought this yeah. was I thought this was a parking lot, right. and I thought that this was yeah. And okay. you're like, wait a minute, where's the lack of parking? <laughs> yeah. So again, we really appreciate um, you seeing us tonight and allowing us to present this project. We're we're hoping to have a good conversation to get as much feedback as possible, so that 
when it comes time to actually make a site plan submission that we have something that that you've seen at this level, but it, it won't change a whole lot from what you're seeing here is what the intent would be. So with that said, I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay, David. Um, I'm really looking at the school street cutouts and bump outs or curb cuts, excuse me. Um, entrances for the drive-throughs are gonna be on that first cutout. Yeah. And back up into this parking lot. Is that correct? That, we're exploring different opportunities there, whether that needs to be just an exit only or if it can be a two-way. Okay. And that's a conversation that um, we're going to have with... See, I just see one issue there of traffic backing up, then creating cars not being able to get out of any of these spots, which then in turn people are going to start parking out on School Street to get into the banks, get their coffee, whatever the case may be. I.e. South Berwick. Right. That's one question and concern I have. The, the, I, we completely understand that. That's actually a concern that we have too. And, and moving forward as part of when we start to refine this, we're going to look at what the queuing potentially will be and okay. how to best address that. Okay. That's number one, but I'll continue on after. So sure. Yep. Okay. Michael? Uh, I'm good. Thank you. Jerry? I'm good for right now. Nicole? I got a lot of questions, Craig. <laughs> he asked me last. <laughs> um, so since you don't know how many residential units you're actually going to have, we don't know. My question is, how many spaces are you short from meeting the um, requirements? So that would be a question that when you come to the next, I yeah. mean, obviously, we're not going to tell you whether we're going to grant a waiver right now. Um, but it would be good to know, like, how many spaces we're short. I'm really, I am the one that hates doing parking waivers, but I understand the need for them. Um, so that's one question I will have. Are these all two-way streets? Yes. Okay. Um, the green space, is it just going to be grass? Like I see like this big one behind building number five. Is that like just big grass mowed lawn? It, or do you it won't. We're going to put okay. a lot of attention into all okay. those grassed areas. We Dog have, park would be good, just saying. We do, we do uh, Sebago <laughs> Technics does have a landscape architect involved, which okay. will look at each and every one of those green spaces okay. to try to make them the, the most usable space that they can Yeah. Be. I'm an anti-grasser, so I just Some of it will be grass, but ridiculous. I know that, you know, there may be features such as site benches yeah. and, and more uh, areas with uh, detailed landscaping. I know outdoor space is very important to our folks in town. Um, so the building size thing, the reason why we had this building size limitation, the purpose when we created the land use ordinance, um, the amendment to it was to, so we didn't get a bunch of big warehouse looking buildings downtown. And now I know people looking, when they see these pictures, they're going to say, oh my God, there are a bunch of big concrete buildings. Um, I actually am from a small town that had a developer come in and do something very similar to this and now I now I see how this happens um, and it looks great like they they did it and it's great and it's a it went from a sleepy town to a bustling town it's it's wonderful um, so I think that breaking up the facades and and when you come back with those elevations that's going to really help people to to see it and um, I think you might get a little bit more buy-in than showing people this because I think people are going to see just a bunch of big buildings. For, you know, you're from New England. We're used to New England where it's a bunch of little buildings stuck together, not these big um, concrete structures. So I think that's what the purpose of the building size was. And if you could show us that it looks like different spaces or the facades are broken up so it doesn't look like a giant concrete warehouse, you'll get, um, you know, we, we're happy to work with uh, however we can within the constraints of our land use ordinance. We're happy to work with you um, however we can on that, I'm sure. Um, yeah, that's all I have for right this minute. Yeah, and of course we'll have to work with James and the planning department yep. on whether or not there's even an avenue that we can go down where that standard could be <coughs> waived or, right. or considered. Yeah. And, and I know that Great Falls only intends to make these buildings look really nice. And, and, and you'll be impressed with the architectural plans that we submit. I can't wait to see it. So I have a few questions that came in from some people from the public that was emailed to me, but I'll just start with mine. So what we're calling Main Street right now 
you mentioned that's going to be a two way. Is that going to be a public right of way or is that going to be maintained by Great Falls? That's going to be maintained by Great Falls. Okay, so the town's not going to be responsible for paving, plowing? At this point, correct. At this point? Well, at this point, just on conversations I've had with Great Falls, that will remain private. Sidewalks as well, because sidewalk maintenance is huge. The entire site. Okay. And lighting? And lighting. Okay, so then the other road, which we'll just call, you know, the one that's coming in from Wilson, that's going to be a two-way as well? Yes. Okay. Um, who's going to maintain the green space? I believe this entire site will remain private, thus under the maintenance of Great Falls. So the town will not take over the green space? Because I know that initially, a number of years ago, we had talked about if anything's going to go in there, it's imperative that the town takes over the green space. Uh, we can have that conversation with, with James and, and what those discussions were um, and where there could be a potential consideration for that. But at this point, the intent at this level would be that the entire site would remain private. Because the concern can be, what right would people who do not live in there, could they use it? Could the town be able to have a concert out on one of these green spaces or have some, uh, you know, summer farmers market out on one of these green spaces? It, it seems like they wouldn't be able to. And, you know, short of a handshake agreement, that doesn't really work that well. I mean, it would have to be something that would really have to be ironed out because one of the big things that we were going back and forth years ago was that we have to have a green space downtown. It has to be used by the people in the town for events that we want. But it almost seems like this, and I like the plans, by the way, don't get me wrong. I'm just bringing up some things. Um, it almost seems like this could be a condominium complex that if I went to a nice condominium and I sat out on the lawn, somebody could say, hey, beat it. You know, you're trespassing. I would do that to you immediately. I know you would. <laughs> so, I mean, what a sh that's, that's my big concern with this right off the bat. That's a um, great comment. I think, I think we could potentially look at some easements on the site in some of the larger areas and through like sidewalk areas to um, ensure that the public does have access onto the site. And the site will have a lot of commercial on the first floor. So there will be just that, you know, the public will be welcome to, to use the, go to the commercial uses. So, um, we'll- This almost we'll sounds like, are you familiar with Dover Point in, in Dover? Oh, yeah. That new development that went in where it's yeah. mixed use yeah, and it's, they right. have, this looks identical to this, except that this, theirs is like five times bigger with individual houses on it as well. But it's mixed use and it's almost the same way. So I, I really think that we should dig into that because I know, not that I don't think that this is gonna be a reality, but one of the big things was we all, we have to have it. We want a town green. We want town green space down there. So, so if you'd like to come forward, just state your name for the record. And Hi, <clears throat> my name is John Smith with Great Falls. And I just want to address this quickly because we hadn't really talked about it with Craig, but I think we do have some experience in this. And I think that the, um, Craig is right, you know, the proposal right now is that it is all private. But on the, um, on the area that's for public use, generally, I, you know, one vehicle we've used in the past that's very successful is a licensing, licensing agreement. Um, an easement is an opportunity, is, is a possibility as well, but usually a licensing agreement really allows good definition around that. And um, Could you explain that? Well, it's, a, it's an agreement. It's a form of agreement that allows, um, allows usage by, you know, whatever the... Um, whatever the terms of the agreement are, so public usage. I mean, the, the, the general challenge with public use on private property is, is liability. That's the, that's the big problem. The license agreement allows for a good definition on, on how that works, and it allows the public use of the property. And in that agreement, the, the town is able to ensure that. Uh, but it's not, a, it's not like a, a lease agreement um, or a or anything like that the, the licensing agreement allows um you know for it to remain private but for public use on it 
That's it's kind of, I mean, there's other vehicles, but that's one that's been really successful in the past. We have a property that's an old school property. It's 11 acres, and uh, it has one building on it and multiple fields and tennis courts and things like that on it. And that, <clears throat> we went back and forth, and really a, a good um, option on that particular property was a licensing agreement. So we're open to, to sort of whatever makes sense from an agreement perspective. But the biggest thing is that we need, um, um, you know, we need to figure out that whole insurance piece of it yeah. that um, that the town is able to offer, and so the agreement needs to, rep, you know, uh, reflect that. And I, I'm just thinking, for instance, you know, if you look at the south side of the property here, Sawmill Hill, School Street, Sullivan Street, like where we have the town sign, and you know, people put political signs up there, mm -hmm. farmers market signs, that would technically that's private property at that point right. right i mean i guess it is our sign is on private property at this point because yeah if not it is <laughs> well, i mean I, I don't think it's pretty close i think that it is yeah. um, well, we had that discussion before i mean it's not so it's it's a handshake agreement now it, it's not an issue but obviously moving forward it would make sense to formalize that in some sort of agreement we i would toss out a licensing agreement um, there if you have a, a different agreement that makes sense we certainly would entertain that with the ultimate goal being the the public use of it for for things like that you know yeah. the ability to to put um signs up and for the public to be on there uh, but just really covering the liability side of it sounds That's like a selectman thing. problem not a planning board problem no, it sounds like it sounds. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> it sounds like a Steve problem. Oh, well, it sounds like a problem that we need to keep on top of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's ensuring public access. I think it's a good. It's a good point, making sure that feel. Yeah. But we don't want to maintain it necessarily. But <laughs> we no, just no, 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 no. That's not necessarily true. That's Welcome not necessarily true. When we when, when we develop the the downtown the uh, you know form based code and the the village overlay district. It was with the intent that we would have open space down there, and it was known that the town could have possibly taken it over in some type, some type of capacity and been responsible for maintenance. Granted, yeah, it would be great because then you guys would have to pay for all the upkeep, and the, that would mean less money that you know DPW has to. I think uh, just on our end of the bargain, we could help with ideas of programming the space. So it's kind of like a just a partnership on that green space so we get the most out of it okay yeah. that's and that's been our understanding all along i mean that's the we realized th this is right in the middle of town and it's definitely that that's why it sort of stayed in the design that way and i think that uh we got a little bit of housekeeping on an agreement but we certainly i think we're on the same page as far as how it will be used it's just a matter of documenting it in the process which we're going to be very interested in doing because we need to if we don't and it's just open to the public, then we're liable for all of it, which is a challenging, on the private side, is a very challenging place to be. So we're, it's going to be top of mind for us as well to make sure that we get all that taken care of. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Could you give me the exact breakdown of residential? One, two, three bedrooms. Are they going to be rentals? Do you have an exact breakdown? Yeah. I mean, what are you thinking right now? Because, I mean, you have big buildings, and I know that you you – you're already kind of accounting for store frontage, but what are you thinking right now for, in, right now? So in, in concept, and I don't, I don't have my notes with me, but in concept, we have, I think, roughly 100,000 square feet of, of um, commercial space. And I think, uh, I think maybe I can get a nod from Julie on this. Is it a couple hundred thousand square feet of residential space? These are real rough numbers um, because we haven't, you know, part of, you know, getting the architectural input on this development, um, that begins to define the space. And so that's going to really, it's going to be really important. If, if we don't, you know, work really hard at placemaking in here, then it's not going to feel good to anyone and people aren't going to want to be down there. So that's a really important part of it. And that will ultimately define how much we can put in there and how comfortably we can do it. Um, so, that's in concept where we're at size wise. Um, the we do feel as though um, mostly one bedroom and some two bedrooms, definitely probably some studio units. Um, 
there will probably be some, you know, a couple or a few, I shouldn't say, I guess I don't know, but not, we aren't going to have a lot of emphasis on units larger than two bedrooms. There may be some in there, might be two bedrooms in an office or maybe a penthouse unit somewhere that's, that's larger, but it's essentially one and two bedroom units that we think are um, kind of an important component into a downtown space. Um, so that's really what, what we're thinking about. As far as the mix goes, I think it's it's more heavily weighted on the, um, well, the, the more heavily weighted on the one bedrooms. There'll be some studios and there will be um, some two bedrooms. I big think a decent amount of two bedrooms. There's a big need for them in Berwick, really. Yeah. The, the two bedrooms, I think, are, um, are definitely going to be important. Mm -hmm. um, but one bedrooms are, are uh, you know, for a downtown, in a downtown setting, I guess, a really important component. So, Okay, thank you. I think one of the things that we're really paying attention to and we've, we've have experience in this, um, what, how we design this, uh, it's not, um, families certainly can move in to a two bedroom unit. Um, and, and we, there may be some, but it's really in a one bedroom unit, uh, some of these are, are geared for younger people that want to move back into town um, or possibly, you know, people that are selling their, their home uh, nearby and, and don't want to maintain anymore, but still want to be in town. We're, we're finding that that's kind of the, the market for, um, you know, what we've seen. Yep. So I think we're not, there, there are no restrictions that we're proposing on on any of these, but that's generally what we're seeing. I don't think you you can or should restrict <laughs> what kind of people can move right. into right. Um, but places. But I know a big concern. I know you guys both know a big concern is um, the impact on the school system, and that's right. a huge concern in town. I'm sure you've heard it over and over, and we hear it over and over. So we want to make sure that. But I think we're not that, encouraging loads of children to move. I think that if you're leaning more towards one bedroom Correct. units, you're not going to have that issue. You're that, going to have. What, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a way to naturally restrict it. Right. And we are leaning that way. I think that it, it's really more so because that's what's appropriate for a, a, a village center area. Makes sense. Um, and, you know, generally speaking, the families with multiple kids want to be where there's a bigger yard space and maybe out around the, the outskirts of yeah. that village center. Um, but, you know, certainly uh, in another project that we had done, we had a family with two kids move into a two bedroom unit. They stayed there for a year. They they bought a house two blocks away a year later and moved there. So um, that was it's kind of a natural progression that way. All right. I'll turn it back over to Dave. Mike. No, I'm good. Gary? Nope, I don't have anything. Nicole? No. All right, and I just have a couple questions here from, um, is this going to be, are you coming back to do one big lot? Because I know this is broken up into multiple lots now along, because we have to do this for brownfield grants, but is this going to be one big lot? And that's a conversation that James and I need to talk about that. And James has, uh, you know, approached me with that. He believes it may need to be broken into lots for some of the, the funding that for, on the site for the VRAP. So that's a conversation that needs to happen. The intent would be that if preferably, if it can stay one lot, great. But if it has to get broken up into four lots, I guess we'll have to go that route if there's no other alternative. But yeah, the, intent, the intent would be that it would be one parcel. You have to look at with lots and new setback creations if it creates issues. And then I can just talk to the EPA coordinator, just ask him directly. Just Frank Gardner, main director of the Brownfield Grant Program. Yeah, I'll, I'll send an email to him. Yeah. Could you? I'll also reach out. <laughs> Good job. Because the, sure. <laughs> it's our understanding that right now, today, this is one parcel. It's not four, it's not five, it's one parcel. I called the assessor's office and that's what it is on record. So I thought it was like eight parcels. I thought it was five. Yeah, there's a recorded um, recorded plan that's the seven lots, but it was never 
is never put into the seven lots. So I'll talk to our surveying department because they did a ton of so research. So when it was registered at the county, uh, the county, the registry of deeds, it was registered as one lot. I would have to say yeah. that if it was five lots, it would have been shown on our existing conditions plan. Oh, so, so it was I, only I broken will... down into those lots, like yeah. in concept. So I concept. For the just for the DEA. yeah I, I there was a yeah there was a registered plan that split the lots that's I I'll send it to you but then it was never done with our recorded never put on our tax maps it wasn't created into seven different tax cards but it was recorded the plan yeah the I'll plan send was the plan we voted on it was recorded but it was never it was never recorded in the registry of deeds well, no yeah no yeah it was recorded no I mean it was it was it was. Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't recorded on it, but it was never recorded. Yeah, it was never. It was recorded to the registry, but it was on the town side. The department never created the seven files, or, or, you know, it would have been seven different tax bills. It was always billed as one lot. Okay. Uh, another question is uh, lighting. Are you gonna what, what type of lighting? I know we're, we're gonna. Get, that's kind of nitty gritty when we get yeah. into that a little bit later. But are you gonna do underground utilities? Are you gonna be bringing in natural gas across the bridge? Are you thinking about that? No. Any solar? We'll, we'll have we'll have to explore the natural gas extension. I, but it will be all underground utilities. I think that's one of the standards of village overlay district. There are a handful of utilities out there today. That, um, we will have several new water connections, and I think we'll tap into the sewer over by the pump station. There is a there is an existing stream that runs north to south across the site, and we'll have to work with DEP and Army Corps of Engineers on how to handle that. We did meet with DEP, and they said that this the permitting around that stream and it's a very streamlined process if we keep it in a pipe, but if we decide to open it up and expose the water and try to create like a Babylon Brook type through the southern area of the site, the permitting around that actually gets a lot more complicated and it would require a full Natural Resource Protection Act permit, a full general permit through the Army Corps of Engineers. So that's still a discussion with Great Falls whether or not we want to go that route, but there has been discussion on potentially opening that up but again, it does present a, a permitting obstacle. Um, the intent would be to keep it just like, almost like what you're looking at here on the screen, uh, running it through the, a 48 inch pipe. We talked to the public works department. There are no real drainage concerns. Um, a couple times I understand that the water overtopped the roadway here. So I, I believe that's more of an inlet condition rather than an undersized pipe condition. So we, we have started to put together all the stormwater models, but in answering your question, all the utilities into the pipe will be underground. We haven't explored extending natural gas across that bridge. I don't know if the town has looked into, potentially. We have, it seems like, I mean, if that question's coming from, <laughs> he knows. We have looked into it, yes. <laughs> we understand the capital. Yeah, so then. <laughs> um, so just just I I have one more question, but then um, the, just one last question that came from this person was, uh, how did it come to be that the town transferred the Wilson Street lot directly to JCC LCC with the quit claim deed? Uh, land transfer from town should have been to 20 Sullivan LCC funded Jupiter per agreement with the town. Has the town funded Jupiter been amended to allow direct transfer to JCC LCC or L um, LLC? Is he talking about how the so the Wilson Street parking lot was directly transferred. Well, I mean, wasn't it all done at the table where you were with, you were with, it was, he was at the table with the attorneys for Cahaya. So it was all transferred at the same time. So I don't, I don't know if that answers the question, but I'd be, I'll look into what the exact detail of that. And it's just this quick claim deed that's got to be here from October 31st of 2019. So, mm -hmm. which was signed by the selectmen. Um, and then the, the last question that I have is just, or not question, but just a comment is just, I, I'm really concerned about the traffic downtown with the project this size. I mean, how close are you working with DOT and then, and I guess to, to the town as well, I know that you said you talked to DOT about the, um, the light of sight and all that, but 
traffic flows, are you, we got to consider maybe making one ways and things like that? That will be all investigated as part of this project. So we do have a pre-application meeting coming up with Maine DOT and we'll get their initial feedback at that meeting. And then after that, once we have it more ironed out what the exact uh, area is for commercial space and how many residential units, once we have those numbers, we can come up with how much trips will be generated and we fully anticipate that this will be a full traffic movement permit through Maine DOT. And that's going to be um, a permit that will be ongoing with the town approval as well as the Maine DEP approval. This will be a site location um, act permit. So that permit alone takes a, around six months to approve and same with the Maine DOT traffic movement permit. This project also uh talk with Julie and our Regional Planning Commission and our, our transportation um, group as well. This potentially could be studied further for a, a transit. Is that uh, CACs? What's it? Yeah, CACs. CACs, yeah. There's um, money for the shipyard about potentially opening up channels and, and transportation buses um, that are really integrated into the site and opportunities for uh, high-level transportation study for that. Uh, uh, speaking of studies and CACs, we're lined up for a CACs grant for 2024, just the way the funding cycles works, that addresses the sawmill and School Street intersection. And um, we're aware that the intersection of Wilson and School is, is oftentimes um, a high crash location, depending on the, the cycle. Um, we need to replace that stoplight, and we need to replace the stoplight at the bridge. And replacing the stoplight of the bridge will help some of the circulation issues because of the timing problems. And I think if you look at levels of service for most the intersections, they're pretty good. It's just the, the bridge that you look at the lower levels of service. I yeah. know. I drive home that way every day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And looking at the sketch plan, you can probably see, too, that this raised island here, right, this intersection right out by Town Hall, yep. mm -hmm. this will certainly have to be reconfigured to uh, work for the site. So I imagine some re removal of those islands and restriping would be needed. But that will all be identified as part of moving forward when we come before the board again. We will have some of those details ironed out. Okay, I have nothing else. Anybody else from anybody on the board? Good question. Um, trash, how do you foresee handling that? Where is it stored? Are we doing dumpsters? <laughs> That's one of those items that on the next iteration of this okay. plan, we'll be showing where the dumpsters are, and those will be likely in all enclosures. Yep. Anybody online, Jerry or Mike? Nicole, anything else? All right, thank you. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you again. All right, next on the agenda is the second public comment session. Do we have anybody in the waiting room? Nobody in the waiting room and no emails. Hallelujah. Okay. Any informational items from staff? Um, let's see. We don't um, have any, James. You don't have to yeah. come up with any. <laughs> no, I just, I just, uh, have make it up. <laughs> have a good night, everyone. How's that? Right. Jennifer, you got anything? All right, anybody, anything from anybody on the board? Can we keep these? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, next on the agenda is the adjournment. Oh, before that, hold on. Uh, we do have one member of the planning board, Frank Underwood, who's decided not to continue on the planning board for another term. So we do have a, right now we have a regular member open position. We have an alternate, Jerry Graybill, right now, who's more than welcome to, if he wants to, to email me and James. They're promoted. And ask to go before the selectmen to become a regular member for a three-year term. And then we'll have two alternate positions after that. So um, what's that? Maybe. What a great idea. Um, so that's all that I have. So next is the agenda. Thank you, Frank. Jerry. It's the only time you really get to talk. Okay, I make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> all second. Okay, all in favor. I don't vote, but. Bye, everyone. <laughs>